It's indeed a great pleasure to be amongst you this evening, particularly to speak in the memory of Dr. Ashgar Ali Engineer, someone uh, who grew up reading his reports on communal riots in the EPW in particular. Uh, it has been a great honor to speak in his memory. Uh, I cannot claim that I was personally very close to him as such, but the few occasions when I interacted with him, sat in front of him particularly at Satara, for example, when uh, the Ambedkar Academy of Kishore Bedkihar would invite him to speak. And it was at that time that he was, in a sense, beyond the question of only communalism and thinking in terms of how religion should be understood. That was also the time when he would consistently emphasize the fact how religion needs to be reread in the present context. And as uh, Dr. Ram Punyani said, he was himself a scholar of Islam. And from that point of authority, he would tell us what Islam meant and therefore what Islam didn't mean. And in that exposition, one would also get a sense that it is not a question of only a literal reading of a text, but also understanding of religion, of religious scriptures, and basically understanding of what we do of religion in our contemporary lives. So it was a great learning and indeed a great pleasure, therefore, to speak in his memory here. So I thank you all, but thank you in particular, uh, C Triple S and Irfan, for uh, inviting me for this lecture. <clears throat> uh, friends, uh, I suppose that like Irfan, some of you also may be intrigued by the title of the lecture. So let me clarify right at the beginning what I plan to do and then go ahead with the lecture. Uh, roughly a year ago, or exactly a year ago, uh, I wrote in one of my Indian Express columns on this question of using bulldozers and thought that it was becoming almost as an instrument of governance increasingly. And in the year intervening from that time to today, we have been witnessing that perhaps more repeatedly as to how bulldozers are used. But I want to dwell mainly in this lecture on the larger meaning of this use of bulldozers and then turn to the question whether we as citizens demand the use of bulldozers so much that governments are pressed to using bulldozers or is it that the political system is supplying and creating a demand for the use of bulldozers. And that's why this question of demand and supply, and at the end then, I would turn to the broader question of what it means, not only to Indian democracy as such, but also to the larger questions of the relationship between state and democracy. Irfan was telling me that there might be some benefit if I intermittently also spoke in Marathi. I will try to do that with the risk that it will break the flow of the presentation. And maybe if there is time for questions and answers, I would be too happy to also answer your questions in Marathi. Uh, it is a paradox that we should begin with. The paradox is, on the one hand, we have the Constitution of India, which tells us and promises us that there would be a government which would be constrained, limited in a number of ways, by rules, by procedures, by norms, but more importantly, by the politics, that we in India would have a politics of such a kind, which is a legacy of our freedom struggle, that the governments in the country, and therefore state as an institution, will not exceed their brief. They will always be remaining within the confines of certain limitations. Paradoxically, however, in contrast to this constitutional promise and premise, we also have the reality, not just today, not just past 10 years, but consistently, that the Indian state has overstepped, come out of this constitutional limitation, and treated 
citizens with contempt and their rights with equal contempt. So here is the paradox which lies behind the contemporary use of bulldozers. So while we critique the contemporary use of bulldozers, we also must be aware of this long-standing paradox that this is already embryonically happening for the past so many years that in contrast to the Constitution's promise, governments in this country and those who run the government's persons and the elite more generally have treated the ideas of constitution, constraint, rights and citizens with contempt. It is this paradox which is probably more dramatically manifested by the exercise of bulldozers that we witness these days. Bulldozers are not really unknown to citizens. Particularly, particularly if you are a poor person in this country, you know what bulldozers mean. If you are a slum dweller in this country, you know what bulldozers mean. But at the same time, we rarely come across situations where governments use bulldozers with complete impunity and lack of restraint. Probably the only historical example that would come to your mind and many of here perhaps is the Turkman Gate bulldozer incidents. But that was in a sense politically punished subsequently and was roundly criticized and goes into the history of India as a black day in the democratic history of this country. In spite of that, we come to 2017 and 2017 is in a sense a time when the proclamation of New India was made by the Prime Minister of the country after the victory of his party in the Uttar Pradesh Assembly election. So after having declared that we are now ushering in New India, in this New India suddenly the state of Uttar Pradesh started using bulldozers, ostensibly on the ground that there are criminals, law and order situation in Uttar Pradesh is bad, it needs to be treated with a strong hand, hence bulldozers. Against whom? Against whoever is suspected of being responsible for the law and order situation in that state. So Uttar Pradesh in a sense was the starting point, but let us not really blame Uttar Pradesh alone because following Uttar Pradesh and its footsteps, many states started doing the same thing. Probably the most ardent follower of Uttar Pradesh in this question of use of bulldozers has been Madhya Pradesh, which is still in the news even as we speak and talk today. In June itself, 37 incidents of bulldozer use to demolish houses of so-called criminals, opponents, protesters, etc. occurred. This is from the reports that we can find out. Irfan has already asked me to give this script in writing when I would supply the necessary references as well. So it's not that it is from my own mind that I'm talking of these numbers. More recently, of course, on the ground, that somebody has an illegal construction, bulldozer has been used in Madhya Pradesh. Overall, and let us not go into these details because they are generally similar everywhere, the first point of use of bulldozers is usually on the question of encroachments. Though in Uttar Pradesh, it was also using bulldozers against the property of those who are suspected criminals, mafia perhaps, those who are participating in riots, those who are protesters, who protest against the government. So gradually from suspected criminals and encroachers, the subjects of these encroachments and bulldozer actions happen to be protesters dissenters, opponents of the sitting government, 
and so on and so forth. Not to be left behind, Haryana and Assam have also joined in this procession of bulldozers where both the high courts, the Guwahati High Court and the Punjab and Haryana High Court actually passed severe strictures against them. In one instance in Haryana, the Punjab and Haryana High Court not only stayed the action, but also asked a question, do you want to engage in ethnic cleansing? That was a straightforward question, though, of course, such questions which courts ask are not part of their rulings, and therefore, they only have some kind of a poetic value, nothing more than that. Even then, this is significant that at least two high courts have found fault with such use of bulldozers. The Guwahati High Court, in fact, said that with such use of bulldozers, nobody is safe. That is what the Guwahati High Court said, again, in passing. In Gujarat, under, and this is the statement by the Home Minister, under the leadership of our Chief Minister, more than 100 Mazars were destroyed, demolished. Maharashtra couldn't be left behind because it is a progressive state. So, recently, in Maharashtra also, in January, when there were communal flare-ups in Mumbai on the occasion of the consecration of the Ram Temple at Ayodhya, bulldozers were used. Later on, in a very different context, when somebody was supposed to be a drug peddler in Pune, the Thane Municipal Corporation went into an overdrive using bulldozers against suspected drug peddler restaurants, in the process of which some pan stalls were also destroyed. And giving face to this police action, or not police action really, municipal action in Thane, the chief minister in fact announced that I have ordered the administration to take strong action against all drug peddlers. So you have a list of drug peddlers. You, of course, don't need any judicial process. You just go and destroy their properties. In the process of this destruction of properties, Frontline's cover story recently has pointed out as to how many thousand people actually became homeless. So I may be a criminal. As a punishment of that, my relatives and family would be rendered houseless if you demolish the house which supposedly belongs to me or where I live or whatever. This, in a sense, is the crucial question as to how does this process of bulldozer governance happen? And the answer is, in a sense, very simple, which is that it happens at the discretion of the executive authority concerned. The police, the municipal authorities, the ministers, the MLAs, whoever. Whoever wields authority there would order and bulldozers would be used. One would think that if a high-rise is to be demolished, there would be a long legal battle involving whether it is illegal or not. Courts would be involved. And ultimately, you will have, perhaps occasionally, a bulldozer action. In these instances that I have been listing and reading about so far, there has never been any prior judicial approval for these actions not even routine procedure of issuing notices was adopted in most of the cases. So that is where we come as far as actual bulldozers are concerned. So bulldozer governance, in a sense, means that executives use bulldozers against whoever they want without any proper procedure. This is extra legal and excessive use of executive authority. Then we bulldozer sa vapor, kima bulldozer paddati sa karbhar, shasan vivar, yasa ek bhag hazala ki kuntia hi prakarcha procedural, prakriyatmok mariada no parata, nyayale and chi patras no parata, mukheta ha garib, alpasankhyank, virodhuk, nishet karanare, 
किंवा कथित गुंडग आणि गुन्हेगार यांच्या प्रॉपर्टीजच्या विरोधात बुलडोझर वापरला जाणं पण माझा मुद्दा असा आहे की हा फक्त बुलडोझरच्या वापराचा प्रश्न आहे का तर मी जे पुढे सांगणार आहे त्याप्रमाणे आपल्याला ह्याच्या पलीकडे जाऊन बुलडोझर नावाचं रूपक वापरायला पाहिजे द बेस्ट आयडिया टू अंडरस्टँड धिस फिनॉमिन ऑफ बुलडोझर गव्हर्नन्स वुड बी नॉट टू स्टॉप ॲट बुलडोझर युजेस पर से जस्ट ॲज बुलडोझर्स ऑफ कोर्स बुलडोझर्स हॅव बीन युज अँड देअर फॉर इफ यू वेअर इन द बिझनेस ऑफ हॅव्हिंग बुलडोझर्स यू वुड डू गुड बिझनेस विथ द गवर्नमेंट बट लेट अस मूव्ह अहेड अँड ट्राय टू इमॅजिन बुलडोझर ॲज अन ॲनॉलॉजी वॉट इज द ॲनॉलॉजी हिअर बुलडोझर ॲज अन ॲनॉलॉजी मीन्स दॅट समबडी एक्सीड्स द ब्रीफ गोज बियॉन्ड द गिवन ऑथॉरिटी युजेस ऑथॉरिटी इल्लिगली अँड ॲप्लाईज दॅट ऑथॉरिटी पर्टिक्युलरली अगेन्स्ट वलनरे वलनरेबल सेक्शन्स और पोलिटिकल ऑपोनंट्स अंडरस्टूड इन धिस फॅशन वी माईट स्टार्ट आस्किंग क्वेश्चन्स वेदर बुलडोझर गव्हर्नन्स इज कन्फाइंड ओनली टू द एक्झिक्युटिव्ह अँड दॅट टू पेटी एक्झिक्युटिव्ह नॉट जस्ट पेटी वी हॅव ऑलरेडी सीन चीफ मिनिस्टर्स बीइंग इन्वॉल्व्ड इन द ऑर्डरिंग अँड जस्टिफिकेशन ऑफ बुलडोझर गव्हर्नन्स बट मोर दॅन दॅट द रिअल क्वेश्चन इज कॅन वी इमॅजिन द यूज ऑफ बुलडोझर ॲज अन ॲनॉलॉजी अँड थिंक ऑफ गवर्मेंट्स डुईंग थिंग्स विच दे आर नॉट ऑथोराइज टू डू टुडे वी आर टॉकिंग ऑफ बुलडोझर्स बट अर्लियर मच अर्लियर अँड इवन टुडे एनकाउंटर वॉज इट्स पेट कझिन यू कॅन सी एनकाउंटर्स हॅपन अँड देन suspected criminals get killed as late as in 2019 we had this dramatic instance of encounters in hyderabad where the police supposedly killed the rape suspects in an encounter during recreation of the crime now you might ask what is this funny and tragic thing recreation of a rape crime in the first place but that is what they were doing and nobody has asked that question that time as to do you recreate a rape crime what nonsense is this but nobody asked that question they were killed in broad daylight and were garlanded also subsequently as we know the supreme court appointed a panel to inquire into it but as it happens with all such inquiry panels it has been forgotten so in the annals of police bravery here is a police force that kills rapists whether they were rapists or not no questions asked if the police have decided they are rapists they are rapists and the police decide that the punishment is killing them so the police become the judge and the police become the executioner and kill them it has been ages since governance decided that it should be distributed and organized along functions as legislative executive judicial and we are combining them today now and asking the police to be the complainant the adjudicator the executioner everything that panel appointed by the supreme court incidentally in 2022 recommended that since this was blatantly an illegal killing all those police involved in this should be taken action against but our media which flashed the garlanding of the police has no time and patience to find out whether that has actually happened because police being police in the government service would have certain protections and therefore cases would drag on till their retirement where people would die in encounters where does this power come from this power in a sense comes from the idea that government has the final authority so if the executive arrogates that authority to itself then you can imagine what the legislature would be doing because after all the legislature is elected by the people so the legislature would say that look we are elected we can do and make laws as we want that is legislative variant of bulldozer governance and india 
while we talk of executive governance through bulldozers, has also a strong element of legislative element of bulldozer governance. There is a long history to that, unfortunately. As I said initially in the mentioning of the paradox, the Indian state has always thought that it is the boss and therefore has always tried to take up as much authority as possible. But to look at the recent context, since we are talking of the past 10 years or so, we can go back maybe another couple of decades and find out what is happen happening to this legislative variance of bulldozer governance. That has a context, and why I'm going, to, going back to, let's say, 25, 30 years in the 80s. Because it was in the 1980s when this animal called terrorism was invented by American intelligentsia. Once they invented this animal called terrorism, think tanks everywhere in the world started saying that strong laws are necessary to tackle terrorism. Ordinary laws are not enough. In a sense, this is a defeat of democratic form of government. That ordinary laws, or laws are not enough and you need extraordinary laws. In India, post Khalistan, this idea that terrorism is hovering around and we suddenly need extra laws to handle terrorism captured the imagination of our policy makers. And thus, from 1987 onwards, we have a spate of such laws emerging in the country. TADA, that was 1987. Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Act, which was subsequently, of course, withdrawn. Then post 9-11 came the second moment of this realization that there is global terrorism. Because since America says that there is global ter terrorism, then there must be global terrorism, surely. And if there is global terrorism and United States is also passing strong laws, because they passed strong laws then, then we must pass strong laws ourselves. So POTA, POTA, Prevention of Terrorism Act. The Congress opposed it and subsequently then repealed that act when it came to power under the UPA government. But POTA was the second such large example of legislative bulldozer governance. <coughs> the UAPA already existed, and that's why I said that this penchant that we need to have special laws is not new. However, if you look at the amendments, which are the jarring amendments of the UAPA, they have come more recently in 2004, 2008, and 2019. These are the three jarring amendments to the UAPA, as a result of which UAPA now sits almost on a pedestal, not an ordinary law at all. Finally, and nothing to do with directly terrorism, but the cunning of the state, as the philosophers would call it, is such that the next law that I am going to mention is also in the arguments in the court connected with the idea of terrorism, and that is PMLA 2002, Prevention of Money Laundering Act. So you launder the money, you take away the money, and pay the terrorists. That's the, now the cunning of the state that is being argued in the course of law. If you look at all these laws, and I'm not a legal expert, so I will not go into the details, but you know the details generally from what you can read about them, is that they give extraordinary powers of arrest, less powers to the judiciary to intervene, and in some cases, and I will mention this again if time permits later, you are guilty till proven innocent. Now this is something of a new variant. This is a new discovery of Indian jurisprudence because ordinary jurisprudence says that you are innocent till proven guilty. Tumi jo parenta doshi aate siddha nahi ho, to parenta tumi niraprad aata asa manna. Ha kaidya cha ane eku nyay prakriya cha gabha samajla zai cha. PMLA nantar je jurisprudence cha lele, tya chad eku nranga asa hai ki tumi jo parenta 
सिद्ध होत नाही की तुम्ही निरपराध आहात तोपर्यंत तुम्ही अपराधी आहात आणि कोण सिद्ध करणार तुम्ही निरपराध आहात हे अर्थातच तुम्ही स्वतः सरकार काही तुम्ही निरपराध आहात हे सिद्ध करायला येणार नाही ॲज ए पार्टी अरेस्टिंग यू द स्टेट इज नॉट गोईंग टू प्रूव्ह दॅट यू आर इनसंट सो द बर्डन ऑफ प्रूफ ॲज दे कॉल इट इन ज्युरिस प्रुडन्स इज ऑन द ॲक्युज्ड सो दॅट इज हाऊ ए कम्प्लीट टर्न अराउंड हॅज टेकन प्लेस legislatively and that is why i thought that this bulldozer governance analogy should not stop merely as the actual use of bulldozers many of these things have happened in last 10 15 years but more specifically in the last 10 years state governments have intervened to pass laws so these laws are of course laws which govern the large question of terrorism but organized crime is something that states handle or don't handle really but they have the capacity to pass laws and therefore various laws about organized crime have been passed by state governments but that is not all other laws passed by the state governments of late in the last 10 years include for example if you want a test of it something that didn't become a law at least for the moment is the public safety uh act that the government of maharashtra wanted to bring about the public safety bill 2014 and maharashtra government is not very you may say original because most of the provisions of the pa uh, this public safety draft were lifted from a similar act which is already in existence in chatisgarh so it is already there and you are just lifting them from here and saying that we want to give jan suraksha that law funnily but tragically also uses terms such as urban and naxal because some film personality writes a book suddenly urban and naxal have become legal categories and the government is using them in the draft bill not even knowing for example that scholars no more use the term naxal they use the term maoist instead and even among them there are varieties and varieties of who are the maoists good bad ugly all sorts of maoists but you use terms which are in a sense lifted from the book written by somebody and start transposing them into the draft bill in order to give suraksha to the jana jana suraksha bill that was the name of the bill then there are acts passed by many state governments governing conversion cow slaughter and the sale of beef and related things these are matters under the state list states have passed laws they are all so wide ranging in their provisions that practically the police can arrest anyone on the ground of suspicion of having lured somebody to convert into some other religion just because somebody writes a book or publishes a film called love jihad you start saying that it is actually happening and maharashtra actually has a committee sitting on this question of uh, inter religious uh, marriages in other words it is this narrowing of the larger question of how people should interact with each other how police should govern or how police should not govern what are the constraints that the judiciary should impose everything has been thrown to the winds and therefore we now actually have entered into the era of bulldozer governance not just because bulldozers are used so nobody's house needs to be bulldozed but they can be arrested and they can be arrested on any of these charges that we have been listing so far terrorism money laundering conversion cow slaughter sale purchase of cows business in brief and so on and so forth so there are a set of union laws and a set of state laws both of which combine into a legislative terror created by this bulldozer governance you may ask a question that india being a democracy 
aren't there any checks and balances? The theoretical checks and balances obviously come from the legislature itself checking the executive. But here we have instances where legislatures are going overboard and passing these laws. And therefore, legislatures exercising restraint on the executive is almost a rarity now. It is unlikely to happen anymore. <coughs> the way our parties are organized, the way ruling parties are controlled everywhere. And the way the Anti-Defection Act has been understood means that legislatures simply can't control the executive anymore. This myth that in a parliamentary democracy, legislature controls the executive has already been discarded in India, theoretically and judicially, by the Anti-Defection Act. And remember, the Anti-Defection Act was passed by, I remember, by consensus. Nobody opposed it, though from outside, Madhu Limay had warned that this is, in a sense, a devastating development, which it has happened. The other check probably institutionally should come from the judiciary. But barring the couple of instances that I mentioned, Guwahati High Court and Punjab and Haryana High Court, in one instance each, the judiciary either has not been called upon to intervene or has refused to intervene or has ducked simply, has not done anything. And we'll speak more about the judiciary later. So in a sense, this bulldozer governance has become possible because of the collusion between the executive and the legislature on the one hand. and a complete side-tracking, sidelining of the judiciary as a control mechanism, as a regulatory mechanism in the field of governance or in the question of power asymmetry. To say the least, because I will say more about the judiciary later, so to say the least about the judiciary at this point, the approach of the judiciary to bulldozer governance has generally been indulgent. Premani Sahan Karnachi Ekun Naya Palikechi Vrutti Yak Aidan Chani bulldozer governance Chabakti Rahili. Indulgence. So the question then is how is this all happening suddenly? 20 years ago, maybe, post Mandal 1990. At least in my subject, political science, oh, democracy is alive and kicking. There are new forces coming up, etc., etc. In fact, we were then talking about how democracy might now be deepening. And instead of that, suddenly a reversal has happened. So the question is, how is this happening? The usual culprit, of course, is we, the people. So the usual answer to this question, how is this happening, is that, oh, people demand it. If you ask any MLA or minister in private or probably even in public, they will say there is public pressure on us and therefore we need to take strong action. If you ask them about bulldozer governance, they will say, what can we do? The situation is bad, crime is organized, police are helpless, they don't have good weapons, and therefore we need strong action because as elected representatives, we have to face public pressure, partly true. Because in our minds, as citizens, there is always a wild person residing in us. This wild person wants instant justice. When we see something wrong happening, we want instant punishment. That's one. Secondly, it is true that criminal justice system in this country is so complicated and dilapidated that often things don't happen the way they are expected to happen in the books. There are occasionally, for example, cases like Dimapur in Nagaland, where people got so angry that they actually broke a jail, drew out a criminal, and killed him to death. This is 2015 Dimapur jailbreak. Much earlier, 20 years ago, in Nagpur, in the court premises, in the infamous Akku Yadav case, women stormed the court premises and 
snatched away this criminal from the police and killed him and it went on to become a kind of folklore of mob justice such things happen they happen out of desperation they happen out of exasperation the question is do therefore people in their sane minds when they are away from these very disturbing developments really endorse bulldozer governance that really should be the question if we start asking this question and finding out if there is any evidence for that we find limited evidence for this argument that people want or demand bulldozer justice the way i have now expanded the idea of bulldozer justice let us say that it incorporates these two elements one strong leader the image of a strong leader and two related to that a leader unrestrained by procedures these are at the heart of bulldozer justice or bulldozer governance so let me look at tell uh, uh, run you through some data 20 years ago in one of our studies we asked this question the question wording was we should have a strong leader who does not have to bother about elections we should have a strong leader who does not have to bother about elections subsequently we realized that the wording of the question was still problematic because not bother about elections means what but anyway we asked this question and we found that those who initially said that they uphold democracy as the ideal and most suitable form of government among them 31% agreed with this statement that we should have a strong leader uh, who is not bothered by elections so obviously there seems to be a constituency a small group of people though they are outnumbered by those who disagree with it there is a group of people or was a group of people 20 years ago who believed in this craving for strong leader and that craving is always there subsequently just before the latest divine incar divine incarnation happened in 2014 we asked a question in 2013 in 2013 we asked this question we should get rid of parliament and elections and have a strong leader to decide things and now we will realize why mr narendra modi got elected in 2014 because when we asked this question in 2013 whether you agree that we should have we should get rid of parliament and elections and have a strong leader to decide things 39% people agreed and this time the balance was tilted in favor of those who agree 39 agreed and 37 36 disagreed so that is where we had come by 2013 this time around in the national election study of 2024 we thought that these abstract questions about strong leader probably don't work well they mislead the people because who doesn't like a strong leader so we asked a more specific question we said do you agree that once leaders are elected there is no need to have constitution courts and other checks once leaders are elected there is no need to have other checks further once elected you can do whatever you like that is what the government is currently doing this time around 27 agreed against 58 who disagree so to the specific question whether leader should be given a carte blanche the support is less but sizable we must admit that there is a small sizable group something like 27% one fourth one in every four persons seems to be attracted to this idea that once leaders are elected they should be free to do what they want obviously this is a failure of our 
overall public training of what democracy means. Because in this, democracy has come to mean that once you are elected, for the next two, three, four, or five, whatever years, you have a mandate. And this idea of mandate, incidentally, you will find, is very popular in media. The moment somebody is elected with one vote difference, everyone starts talking about, but there is a people's mandate. Elections in a democracy don't give mandates. They give you permission to rule according to the law for the next specified period. Only when there is a referendum or something of that kind, you can claim to have a mandate. When you face the electorate saying that tomorrow I will abolish the constitution of India, and you are elected, then you might say that I have the mandate to abolish this constitution. Till then, the architecture of our state powers is such that you have a constitution, and elections as part of that constitution only tell you that you can do only this much with these many riders. He sagri bandhanayet, yevdaas kaale, ani yaha yaha sagriya mariyadan madhe tumala yaha goshti karta hai, yeti yevdaas niwad nuka saangtaat. Tiya mohi heje thotaand hai mandate na vaach, te aplea public discourse manna, charvajenik charcha vishwa madna zar gela, tar niwadun alela manus, kima pada dhikari, kima satta dhari, kahi hi karu shakto. पालक मंत्री त्या जिल्ह्याचा राजा असतो अशासारख्या ज्या सोयीस्कर कल्पना आपल्या लोकशाहीत आपण करून घेतलेल्या आहेत खासदारांना निधी देण्याची वेळगळ कल्पना आपल्या लोकशाहीमध्ये जी आपण स्वीकारलेली आहे त्या सगळ्या मग बाजूला जातील आणि आपल्याला लोकशाही हाती लागू शकेल बट दॅट डझंट हॅपन वी हॅव क्रिएटेड दिस एंटायर एडिफिस ऑफ रॉंग नोशन्स ऑफ वॉट डेमोक्रेसी मीन्स ॲज अ रिझल्ट ऑफ विच one out of every four persons today seems to be inclined that once elected, you don't require further checks and restrictions. However, let me also tell you before I turn to the next part, this 27 percent don't have any specific social profile. Manje he samajaya cha kutle amuke ka vargat na alet ka satta vishtak ke lo, the nai. The social profile is diffused. They come from different social sections, upper, middle, lower classes, backward castes, no, traditionally upper castes or forward castes, different parts of the country, etc. In the sense, this is good news that there is no solid constituency of those who believe in this. But it is also a bad news in the sense that with this diffused support, if, as I am now going to tell you in a minute, a strong supply mechanism begins to supply you with bulldozer ideas, there will be many more takers across the society because it then becomes an attractive idea. Let us therefore turn more to supply side of this bulldozer governance rather than merely focusing on this question of whether people are responsible. I would say, yes, there is a certain sizable demand for bulldozer governance, which can easily be appropriated and used as an energy for politics of a certain kind, which is being done presently. But that means that, therefore, there is a need to also have a very strong supply side to this bulldozer governance. There has to be somebody who is designing this supply very regularly and systematically, both politically and theoretically, for people to say that, yes, we want an unhindered leader. Anyone who understands public opinion even cursorily would know that we don't have opinions inherent in us. I am not born with opinions. My opinions are formed through a process of socialization, and therefore, it's a function of what kind of politics is happening around, who my leaders are, what they are telling me, how they are asking me to behave, and so on and so forth. So let us look at this supply side. On a small scale, this supply-like demand is always there. You have a sundry MLA who actually specializes in going to government offices and browbeating government officers. And then he becomes a popular MLA. 
because newspapers would flash his conquests. That XYZ MLA went to the Talati or Tehsildar office and beat up the Tehsildar. He becomes a kind of hero locally. There are also maverick police officers and administrators. In spite of the so-called steel frame that India wanted to create, etc., there are mavericks. You in Mumbai did have a maverick some 30 years ago, I guess, uh, who would go on demolishing. So there are maverick political public officers. They generally become popular. They are invited to social gatherings, cultural functions, etc. Sometimes some of them contest elections and ultimately fade away. But this small granular existence of supply of bulldozer governance is always there. In spite of the Indian Police Academy and what it teaches, I don't know what they teach. They supposedly teach constitution there at Hyderabad. But in spite of that, there are police officers at the IPS cadre also who think that strong arm techniques matter and they help. That will always happen in any society. However, we could have easily ignored that supply if there were no strong supply of bulldozer governance, which India suddenly started having in 2014. But to be fair, I must also say that strong leaders is not something very new to Indian politics. The only difference is that strong leaders always prof sort of promise two things. One is they promise you of what one can describe as gifts, benign gifts. And they also sometimes promise you with divine punishments. The earlier breed of strong leaders were famous for their benign gifts. If you look at the slogans of N.T. Ramarao, M.G. Ramachandran, all strong leaders in their own right and actually strong in the sense that they wielded extraordinary power. They wielded extra constitutional power also, yes, but they wielded it mainly in order to distribute benign gifts. Jai Lalita then also followed in the footsteps of this genre, but came close to also using the stick. The other All India example that would come to mind obviously is that of Indira Gandhi between 1970 and 73 when she constituted the supply side in a sense. But if you look at the politics of India then and even the politics of her dilapidated Congress party, you will find that there were far too many restrictions on Indira Gandhi internally and the bureaucracy was much more strong then to have resisted at least partly what she designed or wanted. As a result of which, she actually had to switch off and trespass democratic thresholds subsequently. So I would say that in spite of these past examples, we didn't really have in India a full-fledged supply side of bulldozer governance until this language of her ghar or ek akela became popular. And it became popular through engineering. It became popular through manufacturing. So it has become popular. We have come to believe, many well-thinking people also have come to believe, economists particularly have come to believe that something great has happened to India in 2014. Since then, Though earlier also we had the names of Indira Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru to the various schemes, the personal guarantee of a leader for any government scheme was not heard earlier. Now we have a personal guarantee of the leader, which then means that there is a complete supply of bulldozer. You may ask, but where is the bulldozer? There has not been a divine punishment. And I would say that we don't know that there is a divine punishment because those punishments were sold as master strokes. 
there at least have been two divine punishments that this country has undergone in the last 10 years massive divine punishments one demonetization and two lockdown in both cases as we have defined earlier there was no prior legislative approval in both cases there was never complete judicial scrutiny in both cases there was not even a proper legal architecture available lockdown was imposed god knows under which clause of the course unless of course you go back to the plague period and use the law that time and use it but that was for the states and not for the union so all definitions of this bulldozer governance that we deployed initially tell us that these two things fit that the executive did those things because the executive thought that they were great things the executive did these things without any internal scrutiny the executive did these things without any judicial intervention subsequently a very tame judicial intervention in the case of demonetization though but otherwise generally indulgence as i said earlier the judiciary simply indulged as far as these two massive bulldozer actions were concerned so we talk of bulldozers of the up chief minister and the mp chief minister forgetting that a larger umbrella bulldozer governance has already obtained and has come into being and is supplying ideas of bulldozer governance to this country to this public to its citizens and to its politics let me now turn more elaborately for a minute to the judiciary since we have talked of the judiciary already bulldozer governance cannot become possible unless there is judicial approval or if a bad word is to be used collusion participation and that is what has happened increasingly over the past decade and so what has happened in the past decade as a constitutional scholar has said india's judiciary has become the executive court and since i am talking of the judiciary i will quote the constitutional scholar rather than say it myself because otherwise sometimes the judiciary becomes very strong when it comes to contempt cases so here is a quote from gautam bhatia for your information so go and uh, file cases against him he says that executive courts means an institution that speaks the language of the executive and has become indistinguishable from the executive that is the executive court he goes further to say that sometimes this executive court becomes executive's court apostrophe s manje कार्यकारी मंडळ बनणं कोर्टाने न्यायमंडळाने ही एक अवस्था झाली आणि कार्यकारी मंडळाचं न्यायमंडळ बनणं त्याचं हस्तक असलेलं न्यायमंडळ बनणं ही दुसरी अवस्था झाली एक्झिक्युटिव्ह कोर्ट वॉट इज एक्झिक्युटिव्ह कोर्ट ही सेज इट बिकम्स अन इन्स्टिट्यूशन वेअर एक्झिक्युटिव्ह आयडिओलॉजी इज लॉन्डर्ड ॲज ज्युडिशियली डिक्लेअर्ड ट्रुथ म्हणजे कार्यकारी मंडळाची जी काही विचार करण्याची पद्धत आहे ती धुवून स्वच्छ करून कायद्याच्या भाषेत ज्युडिशियली डिक्लेअर ट्रुथ म्हणजे न्यायालयाने जाहीर केलेलं सत्य म्हणून लोकांपुढे मांडली जाते जगापुढे मांडली जाते तेव्हा ते, ते न्यायमंडळ हे कार्यकारी मंडळाचं न्यायमंडळ बनलेलं असतं अँड देन ही गिव्स एक्झाम्पल्स फ्रॉम दी रुलिंग्स ऑफ जस्टिस एम खानविलकर अँड अदर जजेस we need not go into that if you are interested you can find it out anywhere but particularly in his unsealed covers it is through this jurisprudence that the judiciary has almost approved the idea which i mentioned earlier that you are guilty until proven innocent this idea though not in so many words has come about mainly in this phase of executive court now you will find that when the judiciary is talking the executive's language 
and when the executive is do when the legislature is also doing the executive's bidding we have a full fledged bulldozer governance so it is no more now a question of just a few chief ministers doing something extraordinary but the entire system behaving in an extraordinary and probably extra constitutional manner even then i would say that perhaps things could be retrieved stopped if supply were limited only to these but then supply side is also stronger because in the realm of ideas in the realm of intellectual justifications particularly in the realm of media presentations all these things are bandied as great if you watch indian language media not just hindi but particularly hindi you will realize that probably more than the executionists of this bulldozer governor governance the media is actually much more excited and a strong supporter supplier of these ideas and legitimator of those ideas no wonder therefore that in our national election study 2024 we found that approval for strong leader comes mainly from those or to put it in a technical language you are more likely to approve a strong leader if you have high exposure to media and you know we are all subjects to that high exposure so higher the exposure to media higher the likelihood that you would support strong leader uncontrolled and ungoverned by anyone that is what our findings of 2024 suggests so the more you watch television and obviously the consumption of television in english is insignificant so you can forget about it though it is not exception to what i am saying but particularly in other indian languages if you watch the media consume the media both mainstream media other media uh, new social media whatever kinds of media then you are more likely to be in favor of strong leader uncontrolled by restrictions that is what i called the supply side if you read newspaper articles carefully for example on yogi adityanath by the way on yogi adityanath and he is called uh, bulldozer baba so there are very popular hindi youtube songs so if you don't uh, want to later on read my lecture you can listen to that uh, set of uh, see, uh, music uh, quoting that music of bulldozer baba bo quoting those songs one political scientist who is really famous and impartial based in uttar pradesh who does field work etc says in one of his articles that media picks up whatever fits its imagination in reality people are not opposed to these bulldozers because they are not used against the poor or the minorities this is in the print by badri narayan so sophisticated intellectual arguments and of course i am sure now more sophisticated intellectual arguments would come about about what democracy means because very recently i came across this reference about bangladesh developments one intellectual turn journalist turn intellectual turn bjp politician says in one of his pieces that democracy has to be given in doses that's exactly what the british were saying in the 19th century lord ripon and others were saying this now in the name of decolonization a bjp intellectual says that you have to give democracy in doses this is the kind of supply that is now going to arise that india was always a democracy because it believed in democracy in doses and of course strong leaders are required because they do great service to mankind that intellectual arguments media culture so that fantasy is already there but now we are past fantasy and now we are depicting in the films reality which is a parallel reality which industry has now emerged more recently 
with this industry which has now emerged kerala files kashmir files these files those files with this industry the supply side is likely to become more culturally strong than ever so at this moment in india what i am arguing is that we arrive at a moment when all things sort of culminate that a towering leader emerges he retains his popularity over a time that the media sort of goes berserk that the judiciary forgets his constitutionally ordained duty and that intellectuals also join the bandwagon which they always do in any case they join the bandwagon so the role of the intellectuals is generally to join the bandwagon which they are doing now and therefore that will happen my argument therefore would be that while we should be concerned with the demand part of this bulldozer governance let us identify the supply part of bulldozer governance to understand how and why of bulldozer governance let me now come to the concluding part what does this all mean in a sense theoretically what is happening is that india's constitution invested the state authority with power and the idea was that it should be power to do certain things you know in political science classes we always try to decipher this poetry about india's constitution being a uh, transformatory document and welfare document why is it so because it invests the state with power to do things the elite here and in the term elite i am including not just the politicians but also the bureaucratic elite the governing elite the experts technocrats and intellectuals all these converted this idea of power to do something into power over someone that transformation has been in a sense central to this transformation that the past 10 years have successfully brought about these 10 years obviously did not come out of a vacuum so i am not arguing that this has happened suddenly because of 2014 i am saying that we need to put it in context and that context theoretically is this the complete hijacking by this elite of this country of the idea of what the constitution means that's one the second thing which i must touch upon before i conclude is what do you call this animal bulldozer governance is an animal already in existence it is the elephant in the room what do you call it you might say well you might call it bulldozer democracy but that is not enough because unless somebody from north america calls it bulldozer democracy it won't be accepted as a proper terminology so i tried to look at various possibilities and i realized that one of the attractive possibilities now making round globally to describe this phenomenon is illiberal democracy particularly farid zakaria has popularized this uh, from his original article in 1997 and more recently milan vaishnav writing about 2024 india has said that india has entered that phase it's an elegant argument but i have problems with that argument the problem is that it's not a question of liberalism in the classical sense as it emerged in the west that is not what democracy is associated with democracy is associated with the idea that we are individual citizens the idea of citizen is central to democracy and therefore individual is central not individualism let us make a distinction between these two once we have made that distinction it becomes clear that it is not just liberalism which is being attacked because in india there is this decolonization industry on the on behalf of bjp which is arguing that this is a baggage from the west that is not the case if i am to be a voter then i also need to have certain personality and authority as a voter that personality and authority is coming through the constitution not through western liberal liberalism it doesn't come from western liberalism the language might be english and therefore might sound to be western liberalism but this idea is thoroughly native just go back 125 years and read fuley for example 
and suddenly you will find that he is talking of the individual. In the writings of Mahatma Phule, and he is probably to my mind the first Indian intellectual activists, activist who pinpoints this idea that for democracy you need individual and for democracy you need equality. There is no question of liberalism here. This is all homegrown. Ambedkar studied elsewhere but spoke the language of this country and its requirements. And therefore, if we want democracy, then that democracy would require certain things which the constitution provides and which are under attack. Therefore, merely having elections is not enough for democracy. Even merely having free and fair elections is not enough because the real fair in free and fair elections would mean that everyone would have an equal status politically at least, if not otherwise. And therefore, the idea of democracy in short hinges fundamentally on this superiority of the citizens over their rulers. For that you need this paraphernalia which the constitution gives you, provides you. If you disagree with it, then you say that we don't agree with democracy at all. But don't say that it is an illiberal democracy because without these individual rights and statuses, there can't be democracy in the first place. Therefore, I am not sure what this bulldozer governance means. Let me then come to the just last part of this lecture. Friends, this means that on the one hand, we have this question mark, the puzzle, as to what to call it. And the labeling, the naming game, is always important because by the way you name something, you actually understand it. So if you say that this is the truncated democracy that we are having, then you understand that there is something which is cut in this democracy, cut adrift in this democracy. And that is the moment. In a sense, this is a moment of melancholy. This is a moment of sadness. And this moment of melancholy perhaps is not unique to India. This mo moment of melancholy about democracy is in a sense currently a global phenomenon. Unfortunately for democracy, but fortunately for India, there are now comparables because the melancholy of democracy is a global phenomenon. Everywhere these questions about strong leaders are being asked and strong leaders don't happen only in the non-Western countries. They happen everywhere. They happen even in the West sometimes. Not only that, but more than India, support for this idea of strong leader is increasing in many smaller West European countries as well. Trespassing the constitution is not something that happens only in India. Mr. Donald Trump did that when he lost elections. So this is a global phenomenon that democracy, which was on an ascendance in the 20th century, has suddenly experienced a downfall. And India, through its own pathway, seems to be participating in this moment of melancholy. Let us not rejoice, therefore, in this point, that anyway, all over the world this is happening. Let us ask finally this question. What can India then tell to the world? And I guess from our experience, at least one thing that India can tell the world for democracy theorization is that democracies break down through implosion. And they break down mainly because of that implosion caused by inner supply that democracy really faces or confronts. If we contributed to that theorization, we would also have contributed to our own understanding, which is that in India, if we find democracy being cut adrift from different sides and truncated from different ways, it is mainly a long process and a process mainly hazened by the current moment. And therefore, its address or its redressal is also in the redressal of the current moment as well as in the long-term redressal of the trends that endanger democracy. Thank you very much.